So good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a great, great pleasure to introduce Liang uh, Gong, uh, who is a PhD student at UC Berkeley, and working with uh, Kaushik Sen. So Kaushik was actually my colleague when I was in college. Small word. Uh, so Liang has generally been interested in program analysis, uh, doing analysis of properties for checking correctness, uh, performance, security, and his focus has been on doing dynamic analysis for uh, JavaScript programs. Uh, he has interned at MSR, uh, Microsoft more broadly, two times, and he also interned at Google. Uh, some of the work that he did when he was at Microsoft actually is has been integrated as part of Microsoft software. And looking forward to uh, your talk, Liam. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you, everyone, for coming instead of uh, going to the talk from the CEO. <laughs> and um, so today, um, my talk is about dynamic data collection diagnostic for improving JavaScript applications. So, um, so this. Basically, this is a, gives an overview of my research um, in the past seven years. I, I, so, in my, during my, so during my PhD in Berkeley, I was mostly focusing on dynamic analysis for JavaScript. And in Berkeley, I was working with Koshi, uh, working on a project called Jalangi, which was initially started in Samsung Research America. And uh, uh, it was also used in Samsung Research America. And based on that project, we also developed a number of uh, research for dynamic analysis. And when I was interning at Microsoft Research, I mostly worked with Mark and Weidon uh, working on the, um, a project called Async Track, which is also the dynamic analysis framework that keeps track of the interactions between the Node.js application and the underlying operating system. And that uh, framework has been used in the Chaco Core engine for time traveling debugging, and it's also been integrated into a, a Microsoft software called Node Glimpse, which is a full stack uh, Node.js diagnostic tool. And based on that, we further extend that framework to be a sandbox for Node.js, uh, based on which we found about 300 security vulnerabilities and we reported to some security companies. And um, about uh, 120 of the security vulnerabilities are considered the highly severe. And uh, in my second internship, I, I, I actually worked with the Chaco Core team working on a memory visualization tool for uh, Node Chaco Core. And we also shared the tool with the Netflix engineering team. And uh, before I start my, so before my PhD, I was also working on some projects uh, like applying machine learning techniques to software engineering uh, problems. Um, so what we usually call it the mining software repository. Um, so in my first part of my talk, I will first talk about uh, this Chalangi project. So uh, so before I start, let me first give you, uh, uh, the, so let me first introduce the motivation of my research. So why do we care about JavaScript? So a lot of people still thought that JavaScript was still the toy language that's only limitedly used in the browser. But nowadays, JavaScript has already been increasingly used like in uh, backend server-side development. For all those companies like Uber, LinkedIn, PayPal, Bank of America, Walmart, and Netflix, they are starting using Node.js to build their server-side applications. And for all those desktop sub software like Visual Studio Code and Slack are all built on top of Node.js and its variants. Um, and this is another uh, graph showing the number of packages for Node.js comparing to the number of packages for other languages. So you can see over time, uh, the, so NPM is essentially broken. It is so, it, so it is essentially exploding. And, um, and this is a, a, another uh, slide showing the download statistics of NPM packages over time. So right now, about every week, there are 2 billion downloads uh, of NPM packages. So uh, it's actually growing exponentially. And, but unfortunately, JavaScript is a not well-designed language, as many of you know that uh, its first version was designed and implemented in mainly 10 days. And in such a rush, not all design decisions were well thought and not, uh, there are lots of problematic language features integrated into the language. And using those bad features, you can, um, it can often lead to bugs, performance issues, and, or even security loopholes in the language. And JavaScript has to be backward compatible. So those um, language features are still around. And this is a joke on the internet saying that uh, on the left-hand side, there's a book called JavaScript is a Definitive Guide. On the right-hand side, there's a book called JavaScript is a Good Parts. And yeah. Comparing the thickness of these two books, you can quantify the good parts of the language. And the rest are what we call the evil parts. So, so on one hand, you have a language that's very popular, but that has lots of awful parts. So how do you deal with this issue? So, um, so in industry, there are a couple of solutions. Either you program your language in, uh, so, so either you write your program in other languages and compile it into JavaScript. Um, so this is what the TypeScript uh, is doing, or Google's GWT compiler is doing. 
And there's another option is that you provide better toolchain support for JavaScript language. Um, so, so right now, there are a couple of tools that are widely adopted in industry for JavaScript development. Um, both, so all of them are basically linked tools, like JS Hint, JS Lint, ES Lint, and Closure Lint. I also interned as the Google Closure Compiler team. I personally also developed a couple of link tools for Closure Lint. But those tools are all built, are based on static analysis. And most of them are, are actually based on very primitive static analysis, or what we should call them syntactic analysis. So this, they just check very um, simple syntactic rules on JavaScript and try to find some potential errors in the JavaScript code. But the limitation of static analysis is pretty obvious. Uh, they are trying to approximate the runtime behavior of a program. And because of the limitations of static analysis, like alias analysis or um, other things, um, it's very hard to do precise static analysis for JavaScript. And because of JavaScript has lots of dynamic features, like prototype or eval, it's, uh, it's even harder to do static analysis for JavaScript. So, and also, oftentimes, those tools usually favor precision over soundness by suppressing warnings. And um, so that's the challenge. And we try to uh, alleviate this kind of problem by using dynamic analysis. And um, in the past four years, I've been working on about two dynamic analysis frameworks for JavaScript. One is called Jalangi, another one is called Async Track or Node Security Platform. Um, so, like, um, so, like for Jalangi, the idea is that whenever you execute a piece of JavaScript code, Jalangi will monitor the runtime events from that JavaScript code and then notify you some basic runtime events like reading a variable or calling a function or setting a property of an object and stuff like that. By overwriting those APIs, then you can get all sorts of runtime events of JavaScript. And then you can build some kind of interesting dynamic analysis on JavaScript. Well, async track and, and this node uh, security uh, sandbox focuses more on the interactions between the JavaScript code and the underlying operating system. So whenever there is an interaction between the JavaScript code and the underlying operating and the underlying operating system, this framework will actually notify you some kind of event, like a building uh, Node.js module is being required, or a synchronous system API is being called, or a or callback is being registered, or a callback is being invoked, and stuff like that. Uh, so I'll introduce the first part, um, which is Jalangi. So the uh, Jalangi is essentially a source-to-source -source transpolation, transpolation framework. And um, so, for example, if we have original JavaScript program that looks like this, which is signs B's value to A, then the simplified instrument of the code in Jalangi looks like this. And um, it's preserving the original semantics of the JavaScript code, which means it will still sign this value into A, but additionally, that's two more callbacks. Um, so one callback corresponds to the reading of variable B, another callback corresponds to the writing of variable A. So when you write, so when you execute this instrument to the code, it will not only assign this value to A, but it will additionally call these two callback functions. Yes? So how much overhead is this A? Yeah, the overhead is about 20 times to 30 times slowdown. Um, but later on, I'll show you a demo and showing that um, it's actually um, a reasonable slowdown for front-end web pages. So uh, because usually in front of web pages, like JavaScript is a single-threaded application, right? And um, so as long as a piece of JavaScript code is actually more than like one millisecond or, or 10 milliseconds, then the user can kind of perceive the slowdown. So usually in the front end, the JavaScript code's function execution is, is, is actually less than like 10 milliseconds. And then when, so after instrumentation, um, this, it, you can feel the slowdown, but it's not just too slow. So later on, I, I, I can show a demo running on the real world applications. And are these technologies intended to be deployed at some, you know, on an offline manner, in some test phase, or actually even online? Yeah, it, it's only meant to be deployed for in-house, like browser testing and heavyweight dynamic analysis, not for the um, production server-side development deployment. Yeah. So, so after overriding those primitives, you can do all sorts of interesting dynamic analysis. And Jalangi handles all kinds of runtime events in JavaScript, like creating a literal, a reading variable, putting field to an object, calling a function, entering branch, unary operation, binary operation, et cetera, et cetera. And because JavaScript is a kind of weird language, there are lots of weird syntax and semantics, and there are lots of corner cases that we learned in a hard way. So we spent a lot of time working on the engineering part of this project to um, make it work on real-world applications. And 
so first let me give you a demo of the Jolangi. Uh, so we have online demo of Jolangi, and this is um, so this web page gives you a live demo of what Jolangi looks like, and I can create the uh, statements the A assigns to B on the on this panel. It will lively shows the instrument the codes right here, and um, you can even see more. Uh, dynamic analysis. So for example, here I have a program, and here is the instrument to the program. And uh, over here, it shows the Jalangi's API. Like I can override all kinds of uh, um, I, uh, so I, so, oh, I'm sorry. So I can override all kinds of runtime events, such as putting field to an object, creating literal. By overriding those functions, you can receive all kinds of runtime variables uh, or values or events. Like, uh, for example, if you have a binary operation, and inside this function, you will receive events such as what's the type of the binary operation, what's the left operand, what's the right operand, and what's the result. And, you, and you, can, you, you can even return a different result to kind of modify the behavior of the JavaScript program during the execution. And um, yeah, and if you run it, it will show that there is a NAND, which is not a number generated, and that usually um, corresponds to a, like a nominee during the execution in the JavaScript program. Um, yes? Have you done any experiment on like doing the actual analysis of what you instrument? Or? Uh, yes, yeah, I'll introduce that part a little, bit, a little bit later because we've done uh, dynamic analysis research based on these two and we uh, use it to check correctness issues and performance issues in JavaScript code. So how do you handle libraries if it's a source to source translation? You just you actually interpret the source as well of uh, libraries. So for libraries, we also instrument that as well. So, so anything that's running in the browser, we instrument that. But we can also selectively not to instrument that. But that actually requires additional engineering work. Um, so um, so when I was in Berkeley, I I also did another work is to port Jalangi from the backend to frontend because Jalangi was originally designed for running on Node.js, and we and we also want to do dynamic analysis for JavaScript in the frontend web page as well. And but in the front end, the JavaScript execution model is a little bit more complicated than than uh, Node.js because in JavaScript in the front end there are lots of different ways that you can trigger a piece of JavaScript code in a browser, because you can like uh, incorporate a piece of JavaScript code just in the HTML file or even import a piece of JavaScript code from the external file or even uh, dynamically request a piece of JavaScript code through the AJAX or even dynamically generate a piece of JavaScript code and insert it into the back and insert it back into the web page. Um, so we experimented, so we experimented with uh, different kinds of implementation, and we finalized our prototype to handle all of those kinds of uh, scenarios. So, uh, so our implementation works like web proxy that uh, will monitor all of the network requests that send out from my computer, and if the response contains any piece of JavaScript code, then it will be intercepted and, in and instrumented. So all JavaScript codes uh, before they, they reach the browser, they're already instrumented by Jolangi. Um, I'll give you a front-end demo um, of what Jolangi looks like. So here I'll start my web proxy. Um, okay. Um, and now I'm going to uh, start loading a web page. That's uh, using WebGL to show a stunning uh, visual effects of water. Uh, in the web page, yeah, that's right. So, so this is web page is fully instrumented. I can show you the source code. Um, so, for example, if I click on this one, as you can see here, all of the code are already instrumented. This J dollar the IIDs and stuff like that are all hooks inserted by Jalangi. And um, and to answer your question, uh, 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 so as you can see, this is the instrument web page it looks like, and, and the slowdown. Um, so the slowdown actually also depends on the uh, dynamic analysis of codes that you are going to write. For example, here I'm going to instrument all of the reading variable operations in the front end web page. So I just creates this uh, callback function saying uh, dot reads equals ID, which means the uh, ID of the source location, name of the variable, value of the variable. There are other arguments, but I just don't care. So, and because JavaScript is a dynamic language, I can just ignore them. And 
if I just print all variable names that are read by the web uh, application, then that will be extremely slow. So I just want to do some sampling, like um, say every 1,000 operations, I'll just print the name of the variable that's being read. And if I do that, as you can see, it's printing the variable name. And I can even uh, replace the hooks at the runtime so that you will have a much higher um, uh, sampling rate, like every 100 operations. And, is, and as you can see here, it's becoming much slower. Um, and I can remove the hooks at runtime. So as you can see here, um, it stopped printing the variable names and, it's become, and it is becoming faster again. So the hooks is because of I.O., just printing the variable name? Yes, and also um, for every variable operations, so for every variable reading operation, you are additionally call a function, a callback function. That's also causing some of the slowdown. That's regardless of whether you print every thousand variable. Or, oh yeah, yeah, right? Right. yeah. So, so, so IO is the difference. That's really right, the right. In in this example, see, IO is the bottleneck. That's surprising how, how slow IO is in this case. Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so uh, based on this Jalenki analysis framework, we actually did a number of research. Uh, one of the research is that we want to use this, this analysis framework to dynamically detect some of the correctness issues in the front end web page. So we developed this tool called D-Linked, which is a tool for dynamically checking bad coding practice in JavaScript. Um, so um, because JavaScript is, a, is not well-designed language, there are a lot of awful parts in the language. And people in the software industry have learned a thing over time called coding practice, which, is, so which are essentially a set of informal rules that people have learned over time. And if you follow those rules, you can, um, so you, you, you can generally improve the quality of your software. So, um, so by better quality, I mean uh, fewer bugs or better performance or better maintainability or even uh, fewer security vulnerabilities in your code. Um, and to give you a concrete example of what coding practice looks like in JavaScript, um, so let me ask you to take a look at this uh, like small chunk of code and think about what would be the final value of a sum after executing this simple JavaScript code. So I've asked this question to a lot of people, including some of the developer, JavaScript developers at Google. And so far, nobody has uh, given me a 100% correct answer. Um, no. <laughs> yeah. So three is, is actually one of the uh, wrong answers that I got frequently. So a lot of people thought that the falling over is iterating over array elements. So uh, they thought that the value should be 66, but unfortunately, falling over array is actually uh, iterating over property names inside an object. So here, because we passed in an array, then uh, it's actually iterating over array indexes. Uh, some people got this right, but they forgot that uh, array indexes, the property names are of a type string. So JavaScript will actually convert the array indexes to string values. Therefore, the final value should be 0, 0, 1, 2. But that's just the short answer. Um, um, it, another issue is that there are some cross-browser issues. In some earlier version of some browsers, uh, falling over array will also iterate over all of the building system function names inside an array object. So like index of a two string will also be concatenated to the final result. And even for like browsers like Firefox or Chrome, uh, if you add additional properties to the prototype objects of, the, of that array, those additional property names will also be iterate over and concatenate to the final string. So, um, so the correct way is either use um, conventional for loop or use building functions to iterate over uh, array elements. So uh, if you use falling over array, it's likely that you will uh, misunderstand the, um, the output or, the, or you will misunderstand the semantics of the code and you are likely to introduce bugs into your code. And if you're collaborating with other people when they're refactoring your codes, they may also misunderstand your codes, and they may also introduce bugs. And also because the falling over array is much slower than the following two ways. So the conclusion is that avoid using falling over array in JavaScript whenever possible. Um, so uh, 
if you want to statically detect this kind of uh, uh, bad coding practice, it's very hard because you have to uh, determine whether or not this OBJ is an array or not. Um, but that's generally a very hard uh, problem for JavaScript because JavaScript is a very dynamic language and uh, type inferences uh, or, and type inferences is also very hard without the type annotations. Um, but in Jalangi, it's very easy. Uh, all you have to do is that first let Jalangi identify all of the foreign program constructs in your program. And whenever you find the foreign over array, uh, you just write a dynamic analysis to monitor all of the values that's flowing into this slot. And if this OBJ at runtime is an array, then you are doing foreign over array. That's. Um, what if it's a polymorphic, like it's an object, array, object, array, those kind of things? Yeah, then in that case, uh, it's still doing foreign overray, right? Because sometimes it's doing foreign overray, then the result becomes unpredictable. So you just issue the warning or whatever. Yeah, you issue a soft warning. Um, so we looked at uh, JavaScript. So how would you actually program this? So do you have some kind of declarative framework to express these properties, or do you have to go and oh, yeah. um, implementation? Right, so, so in my demo right here, so Jolengi provides a set of uh, APIs that you can overwrite. And one of the API is, a, is, a, is actually a for loop. And then you can detect whether or not um, it's for in constructs. Then if it is, then you can just check at runtime and see if that operand is actually an array or not. So, so, so that, so. so I was just wondering if you have to go and instrument it yourself, or, or do you have, have you also thought of working on a declarative framework where you can specify these properties and this instrumentation will be done automatically? Um, so, so far, we don't have a way for you to declare which part of the program you want to instrument and which part you do not. So, uh, so, so currently, what we do is that we just instrument every basic program construct. And at runtime, you can choose to override these functions or not. So, you, so, you, so, you, so at runtime, if you don't override those functions, then there will be no callback being invoked. Otherwise, there will be a callback being invoked. Yeah, that's uh, definitely one way to like lower down the overhead of the instrumentation framework. Um, so in our dealing project, we analyzed the JavaScript uh, language, and we formalized about 28 code smell runtime patterns. And we ranked on 200 of the world's most popular websites. And we found about 19 clear bugs on the world's most popular websites. And how yep. do you generate the test inputs for these websites? Um, so, so far, we just uh, randomly load the pages on those websites without actually doing more, more very specific, uh, uh, the advanced dynamic analysis or testing generation to like trigger more actions in the web page. I was just curious about the runtime patterns. They are code patterns, right? They are not static or dynamic. They are code patterns. Or what do you, what do you mean by runtime patterns? So by runtime patterns, this means that um, it's like if a runtime event exists, it's like a predicate, then uh, what we should do or what we should check is something like that. And yeah. But like if you have like static analysis, usually you have checkers that are also conditional where you're, if the type is this, then do this, etc. Yeah. So the yes. monitor is kind of, that you do is kind of, uh, like for instance, we have not for, for uh, JavaScript, but internally 10 plus years ago, I mean, we have declarative language of specification and you can either check them static there or you can run them as a runtime switch and do it runtime, right? So, mm -hmm. so, uh, so I don't know if there is something really, really specific that you can only do in runtime. Or, uh, well, okay, sorry, uh, but that's fine. Uh, please go continue. Yeah. So, so I, I, I actually, I, um, so here are all of the patterns that are. Um, so, so most of those, those patterns can only be, be, de be detected dynamically because uh, if you want to detect it statically in JavaScript, it's very hard. It is hard yeah, to do static analysis. Yeah. The, the property specification itself, the code pattern itself, mm -hmm. is the same whether if you whether you do it statically or dynamically. That was my question, so to speak. Yes. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so here is the example of our. Uh, Formalize the runtime pattern, and um, so I won't jump into more t details here because uh, we have limited time. And um, so here's one of the bugs that we found uh, three years ago in Hilton's websites. It shows that uh, uh, one day the starting price is at uh, undefined dollars, which is literally on an exceptional price. And um, so Dealing can pinpoint the exact location where this undefined was concatenated to this dollar sign. 
So, um, and here's another example on IKEA's webpage. It shows that um, for some items, last year's price is uh, not in number. And we also did some empirical study and trying to compare our dynamic link to with the existing static link to. And so here is the spectrum. Um, it's actually consists of uh, like hundreds of lines and each line shows the percentage of warnings detected by each two on that specific website. For example, uh, the green part shows the, per the percentage of uh, uh, warnings detected by the GS hint uh, uniquely, and the yellow part means the percentage of warning detected by D-Link uniquely, and black part shows that they are detected commonly by, by, by both tools. And, uh, and as you can see here, for some websites, you can use one link to, to detect most of the uh, issues, but for most websites, you better use them together. So our conclusion is that uh, static link tools and dynamic link tools like complement each other. I'm confused here. So static analysis tool will actually discover all the errors, but it will discover more. It will have false positives. Uh, static tool, no, it won't detect all of the warnings. Unless it is sound. Unless it is not sound. Uh, there is another issue because. Um, sound in practice, right? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there may be some soundness issues with the uh, static uh, detecting too, but there are some other issues, like for some warnings, like falling over race. So static two cannot detect this kind of issue. So they just won't flag that as a warning because they usually favor precision over soundness, and they just don't show that warning. And, uh, and in that case, uh, the dynamic link two can actually detect that kind of issue. Um, so another problem that we look at is the performance of JavaScript. Because JavaScript uses the JIT in time, uh, the, the JIT compiler, which means just in time compilation, it's a combination of the interpreter and the compiler. So what it does is it starts off with in interpreter, and then based on some profile information it collects, it may uh, make some aggressive assumptions and then compiles the function, some hot functions into native assembly code. And the good thing is that it uh, greatly improves the performance of JavaScript code, but the bad part is that um, it makes uh, the performance of JavaScript code very unpredictable. And we, invest, and we investigate this kind of issue, and we propose a term called JIT unfriendly code, uh, which means a piece of JavaScript code that's very hard for the, JIT on, for, for the JIT engine to do profitable optimization. So the key idea is like, uh, in, JavaScript code, in JavaScript, you can write code in many ways to achieve the same goal. While, and however, if you write your code in some way, it may be harder for the JIT engine to like optimize that part of the code. So, but if you write it in, in, in another way, it may be a lot faster. And here I'll give you one example. Suppose that you uh, initialize an empty array and you want to like insert like 10,000 values into that array with value i at index i. You, there are two ways you can do this. You can either initialize the array from higher index to lower index, or you can initialize the array from lower index to higher index. And um, this way is about 10 times slower than this way. Um, sorry? Like how do you determine like what should be a fix up or how do you oh, analyze that? Um, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll cover that, that part a little bit later, but let me first explain uh, what's going on here. So if you unroll the, the, the loop, then it becomes a little bit more obvious because uh, uh, what happens is that at first, uh, so what happens is that if you initialize the array from higher index to lower index, at first you just create an empty array. So all of a sudden you start assigning values at a very high index. Then you, then you assign value to the lower index. So the first half of the iteration, uh, the JIT engine saw that you create a very sparse array. Therefore, in order to save memory, in order, therefore, in, in order to save memory, the JIT engine will actually um, convert the array to a hash table inside the JIT engine. Um, and later on, when 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 it says that you are uh, actually creating a non-sparse array, it will actually convert that sparse array into a, uh, a contiguous memory space. So that goes back and forth, and that actually wastes a lot of time. And also accessing a hash table is much slower than accessing a native array. And um, so we investigated some of the JIT unfriendly code patterns in JavaScript. And based on Chalanki, we developed a tool called JIT prof, 
uh, which is a profiling for detecting JIT-unfriendly code in JavaScript. So what essentially JIT-prof does is that it receives runtime events from Jolangi and it independently simulates what's going on inside the JIT engine. For example, here, if it sees that um, you're creating very sparse array and you are accessing it very frequently, then it will just uh, issue a warning, tell you where the array was created and where this uh, um, inefficient access pattern happens in the source code location. Um, so, so based on our JIT Prof2, we actually experiment some, on some uh, benchmarks like Google Tense benchmark or some Spider benchmark. And um, we found a lot of JDOM friendly code patterns in those benchmarks as well. Um, by, and by fixing those JDOM friendly code patterns, usually just by swapping two lines of code or just modifying one line of code in the uh, benchmark, we can improve the performance uh, by 1% to 26%. Um, and, and those improvements are statistically significant. Um, so here's one. So here's another one JDOM friendly code patterns that we found in real world uh, program. So here we have a tree uh, data structure. Uh, so what happens is that in the tree data structure, there are about um, tens of thousands of nodes. And for each node, uh, they are constructed by this constructor function. Um, however, based on different conditions, the constructor may initialize the node properties in different order. Like in this then branch, it will first initialize this left property, then it will initialize this right property. In the else branch, the order is reversed. And if we just swap these two lines of code, and we get 15% performance improvement on Chrome and uh, about 3.5% uh, performance improvement on Firefox. Um, so it's essentially related to a thing called inline caching and hidden classes in the JIT engine. Um, so I won't expand more technical details here because this part itself can be ex expanded to like a one hour talk. And actually about two months ago, the Chuckle Core team had also had an internal talk about this part. Um, and in Chuckle Core, this hidden class is called types or, or stuff like that. And it's, it's also called maps or hidden classes in Vades engine. So what's happening here is that um, the original codes, uh, the original constructor may create objects of two different kinds of memory layouts in memory. Like if it enters this then branch, then this is what the object will look like inside the memory. The left uh, property will have lower offsets and the right property will have higher offsets. And if we enter this else branch, then this right property will have, a high, will have higher offsets while this left property will, uh, will have a lower offset. And this left property will have a higher offset. And when, you're, and when all those objects flow like to one position and we are trying to retrieve the left property from that node object, um, the JIT compiler can may, may get confused because the left property can be, easy, can be either in a lower offset or in a higher offset. So the JIT engine cannot do some aggressive assumption assuming that the left property is always in the fixed location. Therefore, every time when it tries to retrieve the property from that object, you always have to do a dynamic lookup to find the property's location inside that, that object. Uh, and if we swap these two lines of code, the JIT engine can just um, replace aggressively replace this uh, uh, operation with like nodes uh, with, with something like this in the JIT engine. Yes. So there are two aspects here to identify some issues. One is to formalize what the pattern is, and then to find the instances of this pattern in a given code base. Yeah. So who formalizes the pattern? So this is something that uh, a developer has to think about manually first, or can you even discover these patterns automatically? No, we can't discover those patterns automatically. So what we did is that we investigate into most of the major JIT engines and try to summarize some of the JIT unfriendly code patterns in, in those uh, engines. And then we just uh, formalize them by, by ourselves and then incorporate it into the um, uh, JavaScript engine. But there is some way to do that. For example, uh, in Mozilla, um, and actually Mozilla had its, has its own tool called JIT Coach which is uh, almost doing the same as what we did, but we did it first. Um, because uh, in their web page, um, they also show uh, our tool as well. So what JIT Coach is, is essentially doing is that because Mozilla has its own Firefox, uh, the spider monkey engine. So what they do is that they try to see if there's any de-optimization in their JIT engine. And then they try to see, are those the optimization happens frequently? Then they may give some actionable suggestions for the developer, like to how to 
uh, like modify your code a little bit, like in, in, in that previous example, um, maybe you can just make the constructor to create objects in a more consistent format or more consistent layout, then hopefully you can improve the performance of your JavaScript program. And um, yeah, so this is one way to do that. Like you can dive deeper into the JIT engine and see where the de-optimization happens and then um, flag those um, de-optimization de operations and then Some optimizations like creators and uh, the checker code doesn't do. So, how do you distinguish at the runtime which against which engine you are trying out? Yeah, for the hidden class and the inline caching, um, I, I think all engines is doing that kind of all the optimization, and that's actually hold across all engines. And I, and I think for the sparse array, the V engine and Chuckle Core and also the Spider Monkey engine are also doing the same thing. Okay. So, yeah. So in our Got the common pattern of all the engines and bomb those. Yes, right. Uh, overall, how, how many uh, optimization like that are in uh, modern JIT uh, engines for uh, JavaScript compared to, let's say, the optimization that uh, that are in, let's say, in a C compiler, for instance? Is basically uh, is it the same complexity, or are they simpler, or are they more complex? So I think the, the, the optimization in the JIT engine is very different from the ahead of time optimization. Because in JIT, uh, the compilation happens at runtime. So what they are trying to do is to try to save, to reduce the compiler time as much as possible. So they will actually not use some of the advanced uh, like static analysis or compile. The code pattern that you showed on, on the previous slide, which mm -hmm. of course fits on one slide, may not be that easy. But maybe there is some static analysis that has already implemented 20 years ago in let's say uh, at J JCC that recognize this pattern and automatically kind of fix the problem and th and then this is just basically the the JavaScript world catching up with step by step with something trying to do it at runtime or no this is basically something if you put it in, wrote this program in C for instance and you the highest optimization in GCC or whatever and you still this is an open problem or it's a problem that's been solved 20 years ago that you're catching up here with uh, in your JavaScript world. Yeah, so good question. So um, in, in statically typed language, uh, this issue shouldn't exist because uh, for each one of the objects, their, like, type, their class structure is already determined uh, uh, before execution. So the compiler can just grab their class structure without actually dynamically look up the properties location. They, they can just look up the class uh, structure of that object and then... Well, but you have uh, dynamic typing. I mean, you, you can cast, etc. So uh, you can um, simulate perhaps accurately. Uh, I mean, okay, so... Yeah. Um, the JavaScript execution time, like you don't know what the shape of the object yeah. node would be. Yes. Because in the like different conditions, whereas in static languages, you already have this class node defined. Yes, but so pieces. if you were to compare basically the, the amount of code, let's say, that deal with these, all these optimization, is it like comparable to what, let's say, a modern static for compiler does with uh, all the optimization for like a, a static type language, or is it an order of magnitude more or less? You see what I mean? So it's kind of. Uh, um, so I, 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 so personally, I, I, so honestly, I don't know how many like. Type and the optimization are there in the there static. There are lots of optimization. It's, 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 yeah. stuff, right? it's very yeah. complex. It's yeah. like 10. It's more like 100 or 1,000. Yeah. Give me a number. <laughs> so I think now this knows. is a simple question, right? So how many optimization are there in, to, to optimize, to try to optimize like during replacement or something like that? I mean, like all the classical optimizations are implemented, like CSE and copy prop and things like that. Yes. Uh, but there are some optimizations that are purely based on like dynamic nature. So like let's say optimizing type or caching some kind of things which are different in nature. Like we can't like compare like optimization done on static language. So this is very nature. complex basically. Yeah, yeah, this is complex because you don't know anything. Like you can change the prototype of an object on the runtime and then you don't know like where to load the property from. So. Okay, thank you. This is all. Um, so in the next part of my presentation, I'll briefly uh, summarize some of the so some of the projects that I did in Microsoft Research, and um, so this is a project called Async Track, and uh, um, I, I've already given a very detailed talk about this part um, 
in my end of internship talk uh, two years ago, and you can actually search Node.js or just, just search my name on ResNet. You'll be able to, to see more technical details about that project. But to summarize, um, um, back in 2016, um, we, uh, we developed two, we started off of the of projects that tries to keep track of uh, asynchronous contexts in Node.js applications. So what happens is that in Node.js, there are lots of asynchronous operation, like you can register a callback, and after the operating system has done something, then you will call the callback to notify you that the event is being completed. But the problem is when the callback is being invoked, the functions that register the callbacks has already been popped out from the stack trace. So there's no way for you to like to debug or trace back to the location where that callback was registered. So we tried to uh, implement the instrumentation framework that keeps track of this async context in Node.js. And um, so that framework has been integrated into uh, Glimpse for Node.js, which is a full stack diagnostic tool for Node.js developed by Microsoft. And uh, we further, ex and because initially we just keep track of all asynchronous uh, events in Node.js, then we just uh, um, go a little bit further to keep track of all synchronous events in Node.js. So right now, that means we can keep track of all interactions between the Node.js application and the underlying operating system. So that means we have a sandbox. And we extended that sandbox for Node.js security research. Um, and we found about uh, 300 security vulnerabilities. And this is uh, the title of my talk two years ago. It's called Tracing and Understanding Async Costs in Node.js. Uh, so this is the overview of the Node.js architecture. And on the top level, there's Node.js application. And Node.js application always needs to use some of the underlying library provided by the Node.js runtime. So for example, if you want to read the fire system, you always have to like uh, first require a fire system package. And the fire system package contains some building system functions that allow you to have access to the underlying operating system's um, fire system. And um, there are many other like packages like that. And those standard library functions are essentially just a JavaScript wrapper of the underlying operating system call. And they are uh, translated through this Node.js binding layer, which translates the JavaScript call to C++ call. And um, then under that, then you have the JavaScript engine. You can have V8 or charcoal core. You can have event loop, thread pool, and uh, sync or async IOs provided by the operating system. So what we did is that uh, we hijack all of the communication between the Node.js application and the underlying um, uh, JavaScript engine um, by modifying either the JavaScript standard library or the binding layer, and also do dynamic instrumentation. And um, so after hijacking all of the communication between the upper Node.js application and the underlying operating system, we can intercept those system calls and like enforce some of the security policies. And based on that, uh, we can dynamically check some of the security issues um, in Node.js. And we also verify that as the node bounding layer, that all of the communication are essentially, are actually being hijacked by our instrumentation code. Um, so the key idea of, of, of the, the instrumentation is a, is a little bit different from the source to source transpilation. Um, so the problem is that in JavaScript or in Node.js, um, once you have a system call, the system call can return an object that contains another system call. And, that's, and that system call can have an asynchronous function that takes a callback. And when that callback is being invoked, it may pass in other objects with other system calls. So it's not just simply wrapping all of the uh, building APIs, um, because if that API returns an object that contains other APIs, then that may be missed. So our approach is that we implement our instrumentation framework like a virus in the memory space of JavaScript code. So whenever there is a building um, JavaScript library objects being required, it's first being hijacked and being infected or wrapped by our instrumentation framework. Then when that, when that infected uh, system API further returns another object, that's also being recursively infected or wrapped by our code. So in that case, all of the code that's being descend, uh, that, that's the children of the building system uh, objects are all wrapped recursively. And when the JavaScript code tries to use like those uh, infected objects or functions to make a system call, then they will be monitored by our instrumentation code. So that's a key idea. 
But there are also other tricks on, and also other things that we need to handle, like how to handle the asynchronous calls and how to handle the callback. And those um, part I won't cover it's more details here because they are already covered in the end of internship talk. Um, so our instrumentation framework provides this kind of APIs like uh, a callback is being registered, a uh, callback is, is being invoked, a uh, synchronous system call is being called. What's their runtime value? What's their arguments? What's their registration uh, context? And what's their callback invocation context and stuff like that? And by overwriting those callbacks, you can do a lot of other interesting stuff. So one thing we look at is, this, is, this, the, is the security issue in Node.js. Um, so currently, there are about um, over 500,000 NPM packages um, right now. And um, they are also, they're still increasing uh, very rapidly. However, um, NPM doesn't actually enforce any like uh, security checking or manual inspection or manual review process. So anyone can just publish a malware in NPM and anyone can download it very easily. Um, so there are currently two um, companies. There are maybe other companies, but uh, there are two major companies. One is called NoSecurity Platform. Another one is called Sneak.io that are dedicated <laughs> to Node.js security. So what they did is that, so what they are doing is that they are, um, they have a team of security experts. They manually inspect the uh, NPM packages. They, and they also collect all kinds of vulnerability reports on GitHub. And uh, they collect those vulnerabilities and then compile them into their database. And then make a two, and then they will make a tool like uh, to check the meta file of the NPM package and see if a package's dependencies and its dependencies dependencies are uh, any vulnerable packages in their database by just matching the, the package name and their version. Um, but we think this approach is not scalable, and um, so we use our no sandbox to dynamically check about 330,000 NPM packages. And uh, we found about 292 security vulnerabilities, and uh, we're still in the process of reporting those vulnerabilities to those companies. And so far, we have already 150 confirmed, and 120 are considered highly severe. And those two companies um, collectively have about 600 security vulnerabilities. So a quarter of their vulnerabilities are reported by us. So the other 600, do you know how they were reported? Who reported them? Um, so people, uh, so there are many different ways to report. They either just uh, uh, actively look up like security vulnerabilities on GitHub, then they just uh, compile them into their database by themselves. Or there are other people like me who um, report to them as well. But like if you reported 150 and they had yeah. 600 before, but is it like one person who did like the 600? Or it's mm. like a large collection of things? That yeah, a large collection of things. So it's yeah, so so they are essentially using crowdsourcing to like find security vulnerabilities. So their system depends on these vulnerabilities, right? Because that's how they give security assessment. Yeah, yeah. They, they have a very small base. If you have five hundred thousand stuff and you have only a six, I mean six hundred or like seven hundred and fifty now. So how, why does that make sense? So in, in, in NPM <laughs> it works like this. Uh, for 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 example, if you have an NPM package that may depend on other twenty packages. Those other 20 packages may recursively depend on like uh, hundreds of other packages. So it's actually called dependency hell. When you write a package, like on, I think someone did an investigation about, uh, say, if you implement some, some functionality and publish the package in NPM, only like 5% of the code is actually written by that developer. Other like 95% are all coming from those dependencies. And because of this dependency hell, any package may accidentally um, require any other like package developed by uh, by some malicious use users or other people who are not very careful with their codes. They may actually introduce the vulnerabilities into their code. So it's actually a, a kind of a serious issue in NPM. Um, yeah, this is one of the, the malicious packages that we found. If you just uh, Install the, the NPM package, you will change your background of your uh, computer into a, a naked David Hasselhoff. And um, another example of uh, security vulnerabilities is the directory traversal. Um, so we found about 220 packages having this issue. So directory traversal means that uh, whenever a package tries to set up an HTTP server or a network server, and when the client tries to request a file from the server, 
uh, if the author is, is not very careful, he or she may just concatenate the request URL with the base uh, DIR, then just read the file and stream it out to the remote client. That's vulnerable to this kind of attack because uh, attacker can just uh, use this URL, like dot dot slash dot dot slash, to request any file outside of the working directory. Um, and there are lots of other variants of this kind of uh, attacking URL, so it's a little bit hard to defend against these kind of things. And even worse, all of these directory traversal vulnerabilities can be further exploited to perform denial of service attack by just requesting this dev zero file, which is a Linux virtual file that provides unlimited string of zeros. And if you read that file uh, on the server, then it just leads to the consumption of all memory or leads to the consumption of the network bandwidth which is essentially causing denial of service attack. Last week, there was a HashBerry security fix in Node. Mm -hmm. uh, does your tool able to find that kind of problems? Uh, so what do you mean by hash? So basically, they used to have a constant seed for initializing their hash tables, and somebody can just like send like multiple entries that will go into the same uh, key, that will map to the same key in the hash table, and you have like a long chain, and it will be like denial of service attack. So I see. Are this like is this tool able to find those kind of scenarios? Um, uh, that was more like V8 specific, but it was like through the Node app that was exposed. Um, they patched it last month, I guess. So I'm not sure if, if, if detecting that kind of vulnerability can be mass, can can be manifested as like a runtime pattern between the. Uh, Node.js application and the underlying operating system, it can be like formalized as just a single pattern of the system call from the Node.js application to the underlying operating system, then it can be detected by this kind of tool. Um, there are many other like interesting malicious packages of, sec of security vulnerabilities that we found in NPM. Um, like we also found a worm in NPM. So what it happens is that if you install the package, it will self-replicate and publish itself on the NPM again. And uh, we, also, we also have some uh, prank uh, NPM packages like Rockstar. What happens is that if you install that package, it will use the victim's NPM account to give itself a star on NPM. So um, we also found some, some packages, once you install that package, it will override some of the other packages on your computer. Um, we also found some packages that, ha that, that are having some privacy issues. Like every time we install that package, it will collect some of your data on your computer and send it to Google Analytics or send it to its own private server. Um, and for some packages, every time we use it, it will, it will collect your machine's information and send it to a remote private server and stuff like that. Um, yeah, we report our vulnerabilities to a sneak IO. They send me cards, and then we report another bunch of them. They send me another card and T-shirt. Um, and this and, the, and this instrumentation framework also enables other kinds of applications. For example, because you can keep track of asynchronous uh, events in Node.js, you can actually visualize them, and it will help debugging. It will help program understanding and stuff like that. It's also helping TDD to like uh, um, for better time traveling debugging, because when you are in a callback function in the time traveling debugger, uh, oftentimes you want to jump back to the position where uh, the callback was registered instead of jumping back to the uh, exact function that's being executed before that the callback function was being executed. And um, it can be also be used to uh, detect security issues or um, this. Uh, so maybe you can also implement like a container inside Node.js because you're essentially hijacking all of the interactions between Node.js and the underlying operating system. You can like implement some sort of uh, containerization just for Node.js. Um, yeah, those are just a few examples. Um, and for the last part of my presentation, I actually want to focus on a little bit more on, um, on the projects that I've been working on before I started my PhD. So I was working on applying machine learning techniques to solve some of the software engineering problems, specifically like photo localization, defect prediction, predicting bug fixing time. Um, so, um, but in summary, what essentially that I was doing is actually um, either cleaning the data for like defect prediction or photocolorization. Each one of these problems is like a prediction problem. 
And um, so what we did is that you can either measure and eliminate the effect of noisy data in DeFi prediction, because uh, oftentimes when we collect some data from the software engineering projects, there may be, because human mis make, make mistakes all the time, and the collected data may be noisy. And we measure the uh, effectiveness of those, uh, the, uh, the negative effect of those noises in those data sets to the prediction result. And we also, uh, Worked on some projects like try to reduce the uh, eliminate to work on some projects that tries to eliminate the noisy data in those data sets and try to improve the prediction accuracy. Uh, we also try to like reduce the redundancy in training data while uh, still preserving the prediction accuracy and stuff like that. And um, because we worked on this project a little bit earlier, uh, back in 2011 and 12, so we actually did a lot of feature engineering work and uh, domain and incorporating domain specific knowledge into the training data. It's like essentially adding more information to the prediction model so that you can have better prediction results, or even changing the uh, machine learning process. Like uh, originally, it's doing batch processing, and then we incorporated some simple feedback to the loop so that it can incorporate more information to uh, for better prediction. Um, however, I I actually don't want to focus on those part because uh, um, um, there are actually some of the more important lessons of, that I've learned from doing this kind of research. Um, so to show you one, one example, um, this is the technique called photolocalization. Um, so what it's trying to do is that uh, if you have a program that may contain some bugs and, um, and you have a set of test cases and when you run the program on the set of test cases, some of the test cases uh, will pass, some of the test cases will fail. And so the question is, can you automatically learn or, or can you automatically uh, do some inference and find out the bug locations in that program? So, um, so the, the approach that we worked on is called statistic bug localization. Um, it, it's actually first collecting the profiling information, like a coverage information for each one of the statements in each test coverage. Uh, in each test cases. Then we also gather the test outcome as a labor, put it right here. And um, then we use some techniques to try to like predict or infer the probable bug location inside the program. And actually back in 2009, people in that research area already started using neural networks to like predict so where the bug is probably inside that program. So they first uh, use the neural network to like Based on this uh, coverage information and this labor, which is test pass or test fail, to try to predict the testing outcome. And when they learn that neural networks, then they just do some feature selection and see which like statements uh, is the most influential effect to to make the predictor predict that this uh, uh, output is fail or pass. Uh, yes. So is it an assumption that there is only one bug? Uh, no, there are um, there are two different kinds of prediction techniques. One is called single bug uh, bug localization, and the, another one just assumes that there are multiple bugs in the code. Okay. And where does the training data come from for training these systems? So you have a repository of you know, bug fixes in the past that you look at? Or? No, not bug fixes. Uh, so, so the so uh, let me see. So, so, so the training so. Uh, in, in that example that I just mentioned, uh, the training data just, just so it just looks like this. Each instance is the coverage information, and each uh, labor of that instance is just the test outcome. And then they just the first ask the machine learning detector to first predict uh, accurately the test outcome. Then they try to uh, take a look at the machine learning model and try to find out which like statement or which feature is the most influential effect leading. Uh, to make that predictor to believe that this should be a failed test case. Yeah, so, but, um, but uh, uh, a lot of people have take, take a look at a lot of different kinds of machine learning techniques. They also even use decision tree, which is even easier for you to like find out which line of code is mostly influential for, uh, for, for, for predicting and test the outcome. Um, yes. So, so this idea is quite interesting. So you mentioned that you know you can look at the model to see which part of the model is making the prediction that the test case will pass or fail. Mm -hmm. But how would you do this for let's say neural networks where the models might be quite intricate, maybe not as, as yeah. simple as in decision trees, for instance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, I, 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 I think in that paper they have some heuristics um, to, um, 
but I don't remember actually the technical details because we actually don't work on that kind of technique. Because uh, um, later on, I will, I will actually show you that uh, that sort of, that kind of machine learning techniques is is not very um, accurate in this kind of problem. And because um, a more simple statistic model is actually more effective for this kind of approach. But later on, I'll, I'll actually tell you that this, even this kind of approach is not practical, and I'll show you some of the lessons that I learned why this kind of approach is not actually practical for real-world usage. Um, so people have learned over time. So, so like this is actually called a spectrum-based focalization. I think it was a kind of a quite hot research area like 10 years ago. Uh, and I, I think like maybe more than 100 of papers are published in software engineering conferences for, 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 for that research area. And um, like different kind, of, so different people propose the different kind of uh, techniques to calculate the suspicious score of a statement in the program, and they try to rank the statements based on their suspiciousness, and then they just expect the developer to like inspect the um, buggy location one by one, and hopefully they can find out, or the, hopefully this technique can help them find out the buggy location. Um, so, so one of the most effective techniques is actually the simplest one. So the key idea is that they use this formula for each one of the statements to calculate the suspicious score independently. Um, so this formula is actually quite easy. On the enumerator, uh, it just uh, counts the number of failure traces that are covering that current statement. While on the denominator, it's just the number of failing traces and the number of traces they're covering us. So the basic intuition is that if a statement, so if a statement is covered more in failing test cases or covered less in passing test cases, then it's more likely to contain the bug. Yeah, so it's a very simple idea, right? Um, and usually on some small benchmarks or even on some medium um, programs, it can often rank the actual bug location like in the top 1% of the rank list with respect to all of the statements in the program. Um, yeah, and I actually I I also have a demo for that. It, uh, it's actually based on Jolangi as well. So because our Jolangi is, is an instrumentation framework, you can do a lot of things based on that. So I just implement that in Jolangi as well. Suppose that, that and this is actually a simple application for MOOC. Like students can submit some reference, can submit some buggy solutions, and um, the instructor can upload the reference implementation then our system can just randomly generate a bunch of test cases and then run it on the reference implementation and get the correct test outcome. Then we just run those test cases on the buggy implementation and then we also get uh, uh, the test outcome and then we just compare their test outcome to decide whether or not test case is passing or failing. And then based on that simple formula, we can calculate the possible bug location. For example, if I just run it, then it will flag all of the uh, potential bug locations in the code. And if it's more likely to be a bug, then you will have a darker background color. So here uh, it shows that uh, this statement contains a bug, and it's actually a seeded bug. And if I just fix it and I run it again, then it will show uh, no, more test, no, no, no more failing test cases, and every statement is considered as clean. Technique that you had published long time ago. Uh, it's actually uh, not the techniques that I published a long time ago, but the, but our techniques was, was trying to improve this kind of technique. So 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 this kind of uh, ranking technique is, is is actually based on very ancient like uh, um, statistical bug localization technique. It's, it's just that's a very simple formula that I showed so, right so here. I'm trying to understand. So what is your contribution here? Oh, so so I. Uh, so our contribution here is, uh, so one project that we did is try to reduce the number of uh, training data that are needed by this kind of um, prediction model, and then while still preserving its accuracy. So, so another thing that we did was that because this technique just uh, is doing batch process, right? So you just give it a program, then it will run all the test cases, and then immediately give you a rank um, without actually asking for any feedback from the developers. Well, we found that there is a simple way to incorporate the feedback, which means when the developer is reading the statement from top to, uh, to bottom, um, so sometimes he may be sure that this statement is clean or he may be sure that this statement is uh, buggy, then we can incorporate that feedback into the uh, photoization process and then 
improve the fertilization accuracy. But um, that, that's not my main point here. So, um, so we, so um, that was the risk. Yeah, because this research area was a very hot research area, but all this, uh, but but sometimes later people have realized that this technique say, is actually not yet practical for real world usage, and we actually um, so after I I actually spent one year doing research trying to improve try to improve the performance of this kind of system on like benchmarks uh, or medium sized applications. I finally tried to work to make it work on um, like large applications like Firefox, which contains millions of lines of code. But then I realized that this is technique is actually not practical yet because for one of the reasons is that when you are work, when you are applying this technique to like Firefox, um, if there are one million lines of code, and if the buggy code is ranked in the top like one percent, then the developer still has to like inspect tens of thousands of lines of code, which is actually not practical. And also, people have learned over time or either do empirical study uh, to find out that. Um, oftentimes, when you show a buggy line to a developer without giving them any logical explanation, they may just uh, um, get confused, and then they may just miss that bug, even if you actually sh always show the bug in the top uh, result in the ranking result. And, and another bigger issue that we found, that, that people have found over time, is that um, false positives can lead to very radical interest to drop off. Like, if the developer like inspects uh, like top five results and they still can't find any of the bugs, then they may just fall back to their old way of doing things like setting a breakpoint and do manual debugging and stuff like that. And let's just generalize that a little bit to some of the challenges for applying machine learning to programming language software engineering problems. And um, so one of the bigger challenges for, 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 for that area is that um, Usually, when you try to use machine learning to predict something in the software engineering project, um, though, so usually this problem actually requires very high accuracy because uh, in that area, there are often an alternative uh, exists. Like for the fertilization, developer can always use manual debugging or there are always other kinds of things that they can do to find to increase the bug. And if the accuracy is not high enough, then people will just get boring or, or they will just get disappointed. Then they will just fall back to their old way of doing things. And, um, um, and also, um, this kind of, if we try to use machine learning to like generate something from a software engineering project or predict something for the software engineering project, usually it's actually project specific. Like I want to predict something just for that project. Well, unless that's a very large open source project or that's a very large commercial project that, that involves a lot of human interactions, uh, there won't be a lot of uh, labor data available for machine learning. Um, so that's another bigger issue. So another issue is that unless the machine learning model is fully automated and it's, it's actually and its and its accuracy is very high, um, the entire process always have to involve humans in the loop, which means that when it generates some results, it has to ask humans to inspect the results and then ask humans to incorporate the results into the real world, pro uh, the, the real world product. And uh, so if the machine learning project cannot give like a logical explanation or makes the results uh, understandable for the, to the developers, then, um, then it may be very hard to apply that kind of a technology like to, um, to real world production. Um, so maintainability is, is, is like also another bigger issue. Like even for program synthesis, I believe if you, if you generate a piece of code and if it's too, um, too hard to read and developer cannot understand that, once there's a bug, it will be very hard to fix. You know? um, so, so this is my last slide summarizing some of the future interest. Um, so I'm mostly interested in either working on JavaScript toolchain support or um, using all kinds of techniques to improve the reliability, performance, and security of software systems. And, and also software systems definitely including, is definitely including machine learning systems. And I'm also very interested in uh, making this dynamic analysis research or frameworks uh, a, a little bit more sophisticated because oftentimes we see a very high runtime overhead in the instrumentation techniques. 
So if we can just uh, like integrate this instrumentation framework called Jalangi or uh, async track directly into the engine, uh, it will hopefully achieve a better performance and uh, it could reduce the runtime overhead. So another thing that I'm very interested in is the program synthesis. Um, because uh, um, program synthesis, so essentially original, in the original way developer are like uh, writing software by themselves. That's in machine learning people's term, that's like an expert system, right? You give the specification either in terms of a formal specification or you give specification in terms of input and output examples. Then the expert are just the customers and developers. Then based on those uh, input and outputs, then they just develop an expert system that uses a rule-based system to like map the input to the output. But right now, um, it, it's interesting to say that uh, the program synthesis can just uh, search for a program that generates the output. And I'm actually most interested in like uh, speeding up the searching process to like reduce uh, the, the, the searching time because I feel that uh, scalability could be a bigger issue for program synthesis field. Uh, because the larger, uh, the larger the program you want to synthesis or more expressive the language you are trying to use, then it seems that the search space will be much larger. So it would be interesting to use some heuristics or some other techniques to like uh, reduce the searching space to further speed up the process. And finally, I want to thank some of my uh, collaborators, either in Microsoft Research or in Berkeley and uh, in other organizations. Um, so, I, and I also want to thank the following organizations and institutes for funding my research. Um, so, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much.